Yeah, yeah, yeah. After. Don't tell me that video sound there, Mr. Debatry. Oh, it's an aftermath. fiction and invention. This discussion is inspired by Lynette Yadambache's enigmatic portraits of fictitious people and the theme of tonight's late, which is dreams versus reality. We're joined by Awa Konate, Inua Ellams, Heather Adjipong, Rachel Jones, and Caleb Azuma Nelson. I'll shortly hand over to our chair, Awa, to introduce our panelists, but just a few brief housekeeping things. The talk will start in a few moments and run until 9 p.m. We have time for audience questions towards the end, so please raise your hand if you would like to speak and wait till you're called on with the mic to ask your question. This is super important as we're live streaming the event and it will allow viewers at home to hear you. In the event of the emergency, please exit calmly to the exit at the back of the room. And now, without further ado, I'll introduce our chair, Awa. Awa Kanate is an independent curator, writer, and founder of Culture Art Society. Her practice prioritizes archival research and the interdisciplinary frameworks of African and diasporic artists. Kanate has curated for Serpentine Gallery, Kunsthal Charlottenburg, amongst others. A university teacher and panel presenter, her writings have also been published in Third Text, Bone Magazine, Faden, and more. Please join me now in welcoming our and all our panelists. Round clap. <clears throat> Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for the introduction, Jennifer. Um, my name is Ao Konate and I'm an independent curator, as Jennifer has mentioned. Um, I have the pleasure of sharing this talk with our four panelists who I'll introduce in just one moment. Our conversation, partly inspired by artist Lynette Yadjumbaki's fantastic exhibition, In the Space, will draw on the themes of dreams and reality, fiction and non-fiction to reflect upon them as artistic interventions across various disciplines, including our panelists and beyond. But I thought before I do that, that I would just give maybe a brief note on the concept of dreams in art practices. Um, dreams as we understand it within the more specific framework of Western contemporary art practice really has its foundations in the last century, um, beginning with psychoanalysis and its development in Europe um, as led by Sigmund Freud where it was really a way to study unconscious desires and understand the human ego. Freud's work has then been taken up quite enthusiastically by the earlier generation of surrealists for whom um, dreaming represented a total liberation from social, aesthetic, and scientific constraints. Um, following the First World War, the concept of dreams in art were prized for the disruptive force as a way to challenge the quotidian or the poor dumb of the everyday. And this has really pushed the idea of dreams or dreaming away from its roots in European classical painting, which has been very much related to divinity or religious practices mm -hmm. and way of trying to depict religious stories. But with that being said, black artists and other cultural workers across disciplines such as painting, poetry, literature, photography, and film, reflective of our speakers again today, have also been quite instrumental. Is there like a small little glitch as I'm speaking? Because I can hear this tiny tick. Is it my earrings? Let me take them off. <laughs> They're just too big, babe. <laughs> <laughs> it's like quick it's, it's part of the look, but I'm willing to sacrifice. <laughs> so I'm like, I can hear this little ring. Is it just, is, should I keep just one on? 
like it. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People are like. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, but as I was saying, um, black artists and other cultural workers across several disciplines, reflective of our speakers here today as well, have been quite instrumental in widening our understanding and remits of dreams and reality. And this is, of course, drawing on indigenous African psychological perspectives, where dreams are poetics, dreams are guidances, and in some way, dreams are actually access to a truth that's driven by intuition and insight. And this has sort of been a way to move us away from a European paradigm where dreams are understand, understood as something that lacks logic, or dreams as something that is irrational. But with that said, we're not here to discuss the theoretical framework of dreams and reality. But I hope that in part what we will discuss is perhaps this concept as it relates to how black artists engage with it through aesthetics, through abstraction, um, through imaginary, through ideas of truth and fiction, and try to attempt to expand beyond that as well. Firstly, I'll introduce our speakers on the panel, and then we'll have our conversation building on a series of com um, questions, and then we'll have some time for questions from you in the audience. I've been advised that there are no um, hard of hearing people, deaf people in the audience today. So our two DSL interpreters right at the front here. We'll be here to enjoy the conversation as yourself, but if we are mistaken, then please do let us know. But without further ado, let me introduce our panel. On the panel today, we have Inua Elams from left to right, an award-winning poet, playwright, and curator. Identity, displacement, and destiny are recurring themes in his work, which mixes the old with the new, traditional with the contemporary. His books are published by Flipped Eye, Akashik, Nine Arches, Pen in the Margins, Orberon, and Matoin. And our second panelist is Rachel Jones, an artist who works in painting, installation, sound, and performance. In her painting, she grapples with the challenges of finding visual meanings to convey abstract existential concepts. In depicting the psychological truths of being and the emotions these engender abstractions, become a way of expressing the intangible. Rachel repeats motifs and symbols across the series to create associative, even familiar relationships between them, underscoring their kinship as part of her ongoing investigation of identity. And our third speaker is Heather Agyapong, a visual artist, performer, actor, and maker who lives and works in London. Her art practice is concerned with mental health and well-being, invisibility, the diaspora, and the archive. Heather uses both lens-based practices and performance with an aim to culminate a carthatic experience for both herself and the viewer. And finally, we have Caleb Azuma Nelson, who is a 28-year-old British Ghanaian writer and photographer living in Southeast London. His first novel, Open Water, won the Costa First Novel Award and debut of the year at the British Book Awards and was number one times bestseller as well. He was selected as the National Book Foundation 535, honoree by Brit Benin. His second novel, Small World, will be published in May 2023. So with that being said, I guess let's jump into it. Um, I'm, I think I kind of want to jump straight into, into you first, Heather, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm really interested in, you know, your work and your practice that sort of straddles the territory between performance and photography. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering with your work that it's so related to camera and its history of colonialism is history in construction fiction and non-fiction, mm. particularly with the idea of like depicting truthful images of black people. Mm. I'm really curious about in what way your practice in photography actually evokes dreams and reality. Well, I think I, I first started taking photos <laughs> when I was 19. The feedback's a bit, can I do something? Like this? Okay. Mm -hmm. but when I was 19, and I think I was unconscious, conscious? down sorry hello yeah good okay um when i was 19 i started taking photographs and i think i felt quite um uncomfortable with reality or the reality i was currently in it felt slightly off or um there was an edge to it i remember i that's when i started entering therapy and my therapist said um 
not all thoughts are true. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, every thought is true. And, this, and then she kind of introduced this idea of like cognitive um, distortions mm -hmm. and that we have ideas about ourselves, about our histories that actually aren't based in truth. So I was like, okay, well, well what is truth? And then my practice started developing around um, reimagination and dream making and trying to kind of um, expand my idea of what truth is. And that for me, a lot of kind of um, reimagination or dream making or thinking about archives and, and reimagining, um, kind of imagining scenarios with archives because of erasure, because of gaps, it kind of, um, the dream making kind of became like a truth in itself. Like it helped me understand versions of myself and parts of myself that were hidden, which I believed were um, how I was behaving, how I was um, embodying myself was truth, but actually it wasn't. It was a version I was kind of told. So, um, this idea of, um, in a, as I'm, I'm also an actor, and this question around like, what if the magic if is this sort of um, question about what happens if I do that? What happens if I'm in this scenario? And this sort of kind of dream making allows kind of truth in a story. So there is something about how the imagination can be rooted back into um, kind of radical understandings of oneself. Mm -hmm. It's a ramble, but does that make sense? <laughs> no, it makes sense. And, okay. and what I'm understanding is that part of that dream and reality and the way you invoke it is through sp basically speculating in some way, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. constant question. Yeah, great, absolutely. And what about you, Rachel, as you work in painting and mm -hmm. with abstraction so, so much? Yeah, I yeah. think something like important you said is like what it means to reimagine or the idea for me of using like alternate realities as a way to consider my relationship to the world mm -hmm. that I inhabit, but also the world's relationship with me. And I think my, I don't know, my aims really are to make works that are as complicated as possible because I feel like the realities that we live are very nuanced and multifaceted, but mm -hmm. I think uh, often we try to limit or categorize or subdue mm -hmm. the messiness of everything or the simultaneous um, reality of lots of things happening at the same time and things that are amazing and terrible and I want all of those things to operate in a way where they can coexist mm -hmm. and that is a way of reimagining or re-engaging or understanding like what it is to basically exist or what it is to feel things or to, I don't know, like to, to live. And it takes, I think it takes time to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I've learned is there's a, a process that has to take place of looking inwards and the mm -hmm. idea of like your interiority being prioritized mm -hmm. and the relationship you have to yourself and like care and space for reflection, like all of that is really important and part of the process of making work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Caleb? I mean, in what way does your practice in both literature and photography and actually filmmaking as well sort of evoke dreams and, and reality? I guess something that both Heather and Rachel said about this idea of reimagining mm -hmm. is something I'm really keen on. With my, I guess, thinking about my writing as a starting point, mm -hmm. um, as both a writer and a reader, I'm always trying to engage in this space that feels almost like reverie-like, like a dream, like that involves the suspension of time, that mm -hmm. involves like the slowing down of pace, mm -hmm. that allows me to insert myself into a space where the interior does become the priority. And I, the kind of question that's at the base of everything is how do I feel? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we work outwards mm -hmm. from there. Mm -hmm. And I can begin to assemble these spaces where I can ask myself the questions that I don't get to every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I can ask myself about my place in the world. Mm -hmm. I can ask myself like about the structures that I'm existing within and how I might dismantle those mm -hmm. um, and reassemble to build a world that looks Mm -hmm. better for us in the future but in the present mm -hmm. um, 
and that for me is really where the starting place is from mm. my work but that involves kind of going to this place where the reality that as I know it disappears mm -hmm. for a bit and it's a I really love being in that space I love practicing the work and yeah. I love being a reader um, and disappearing into a space where I might imagine a better world mm -hmm. now so if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that you don't really think of dreams and reality as being binary, so opposite of each other, but mm -hmm. they're sort of one single space that you inhabit at different times. And the way in which that you straddle that is by thinking about that space as a mm -hmm. possibility to imagine a future mm -hmm. um, outside of what we currently have. 100%. I see it. And what about you, Inua? We know working in poetry, where I think dreams and rea the idea of dreams and reality is such a fundamental way of of, of working across that, that discipline? Sort of and sort of not. Yeah. Um, I don't, okay, where do I start? John Keats said poets are the midwife of reality. Poets are the midwife of reality, which is both a grandiose statement, but a ridiculous one, especially coming from a man. I think he's like colonizing spaces he has no business being in. But also, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because it acknowledges that we didn't create shit. Can I swear? Yeah. <laughs> Acknowledge that we didn't create things. We're just helping the things that exist come into being. Mm -hmm. And the poet who believes that, they just happen to be the people holding the pen when the idea, when the poem is ready to come into existence. Mm -hmm. So I think I think of my work more like that. I ruminate on a whole variety of why and have a pretty eclectic um, set of interests that mm -hmm. intersect in interesting ways. But when those things are ready to come into existence. I'm just the person holding, holding the pen. Mm. And the first, thing, the first time I made something, I was four years old, and I planned um, a city. And because I was an idiot, I segregated a city. So the boys had all the cool things, and the women and the girls were just in the wilderness. And I don't think I consciously did that. I don't think, um, sorry, I don't think I was thinking about reality or fiction there. <laughs> I was just bored in just in Nigeria, and I needed to entertain myself. And that was what happened. I was conscious of the fact that I was making something, but it wasn't blur for me. I was, um, yeah, I, I was trying to entertain myself, and that is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a deliberate, um, there's a deliberateness with which I make, but I'm also aware of the fact that there are energies and um, notions that are beyond me. And I'm just the canary in the mine, the weather vane, the, the lightning rod, the mm -hmm. person with the pen. Mm, I see. Yeah. So quite funny enough, like across all four of you today, I understand that you don't really think of dreams and surreal as being, you know, as relating to the theme of today, which is versus. You think of them as being one, really. Mm. Um, and I'm just wondering, maybe in what way do you each feel that the ambiguity between the two actually make you think around visibility and invisibility and legibility and illegibility as in being able to read some things, but also not being able to read things and using that as a method to refuse mm -hmm. being readable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's like two aspects to that. There's something about um, making something and it being hidden from you as well. Okay. Like there's a process where similar to what you're saying, things are very instinctual mm -hmm. or things are delivered to you in a way that is known and unknown. It, it sounds like a very like mysterious thing to say, but it's hard to articulate. I think when you make stuff, sometimes you can have intentions, and other times you're just like guided by desires or like questions you might have. And where do those thoughts come from? Do you know? It's like what is the origin of these things that you're drawn to, or things that you don't like, or things that you're confused about? And so, mm -hmm. I think there is stuff that is hidden from you, which is like a necessary part of how we learn and mm -hmm. how we discover things, um, but also how we are able to um, like go beyond what is familiar and what is in front of us and what we see, which mm -hmm. I think is really important as black people and black artists, like the idea of what is presented to us mm -hmm. is pretty much always at a deficit. So I think things that are hidden um, that can be discovered is like a territory for for a lot of like, I don't know, like growth and nurturing and like generative production mm -hmm. um, that is healing, but also something that is guided. I don't mm -hmm. know by like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I understand. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. As in, 
towards like an imaginary that's intimate only to itself and yeah it's way. like a spiritual aspect yeah. to it um yeah. and then there's the idea of what you hide or what you reveal to an audience mm -hmm. and what you want to be known and what you present intentionally is something that is a foundation for people to like stand on and mm -hmm. then the things that you want to be maybe a little bit more complicated or a little bit more um i don't know slowly to like reveal them like to reveal themselves mm -hmm. and that's something that i think is really important and it can allow for a relationship to like develop between the work and the viewer because mm. what they understand of it is dependent on their positionality like who they are what they know mm. what their experience of life is what they're interested in maybe what they deny what they refuse like all of these things and there's a opportunity for like something really special and important to occur i mm -hmm. think when that happens mm. and you don't just offer everything up on a plate mm -hmm. and i think it's also like a a necessary thing to protect parts of yourself that are sacred yeah. that you don't just give everything mm -hmm. all at once to people um, mm -hmm. and yeah there's some sort of self-preservation or like self-care involved in how you make mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's my sort of relationship to yeah, yeah to that yeah. Mm. And how does that look like in your practice, Heather, and, and in a medium such as photography, where I think that plays so much with things being visible and invisible? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's my entire work, really. Because mm. um, my work's, uh, one of the themes are mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. I think when we talk about mental health, we often don't acknowledge it or see it until it's manifested kind of physically, whether it's like body pains or the panic attack or depression or whatever those physical symptoms are. And I'm interested in how can I um, uh, create sort of a, an understanding, an, an, empath an empathetic, ear, empathetic ear to kind of what mental health looks like, feels like, smells like. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in how can I kind of depict things which are intangible, mm -hmm. I guess, but really that started with archives mm -hmm. and seeing these huge kind of educational gaps I had growing up and believing my reality was what I saw and knowing that actually the, the truth was kind of hidden mm -hmm. or invisible. Mm -hmm. So um, it feels like as black artists, we're always questioning what is invisible, right? I guess we're always trying to unearth something, whether it's um, like a, in a kind of direct way or an indirect way, there is something about truth telling mm -hmm. um, or readdressing which kind of happens when we make work because I mean as black artists our work is politicized whatever we do I remember I had a talk and in an image there's like a pink flower and this guy was like what does the flower mean and I was like it doesn't mean anything babe it's just a flower like <laughs> this, there is it's also interesting people kind of project a lot of stuff onto our work and um, it's it's true like you've got to, conscious of what you're making visible and what you aren't and and also protecting yourself and knowing that um the priority for me is making sure I'm preserved in making mm -hmm. the work mm -hmm. so my work is incredibly vulnerable yeah. but I'm also very conscious of what feels safe mm -hmm. do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and what I hide and I need, I need protection in hiding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you and what about you Caleb um I think as you both were talking, I was thinking about this idea of representation and legibility and public spaces mm -hmm. versus like private and more intimate spaces. Um, and the private spaces that I occupy when I'm making work um, and how that private space somehow has to be transmuted into something that can make its way out into the world in order for people to view it and to interact with it. And I think in the private space, I'm very conscious of trying to submit mm. to like my most innermost desires mm. and to really make space to be as vulnerable and as raw as possible and to encourage this sense of asking myself, what are the, what are the feelings, what are the emotions, what are the experiences and how do I make these feel as honest as mm. possible? Because I think that there's a real there's a difference between like multiple truths can exist but my honesty will like mm -hmm. ride straight through that mm -hmm. um and then wondering how i i'm always wondering how that then 
works when I'm out in a public sphere and when I am talking about my work and when people are reading this work because like you, my work feels very vulnerable and feels like it is me like very close mm. to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are also things that you do and you feel in the moment when you're making that you can't actually translate, yeah. Yeah. that you can't speak into the world that only yeah. exists really for you. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me is like, that's a really special experience. Yeah. Um, and I think kind of related to that within my work, I'm always thinking about like the mundane and the everyday and how those things can achieve a level of like the spectacular, especially when it comes to black people mm. um, and it comes to our communities. Mm -hmm. And that for me is like a, that's my way of trying to not only protect myself, but also the communities that I write towards yeah. and for. Uh, it's making sure that I'm not encouraging this level of like spectacle yeah. in the way that renders us invisible, yeah, but yeah, actually yeah. that the spectacles that I'm writing about are the things that mean that we can see each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That mode of address is like direct. It's yeah, like yeah. Like I'm looking so at you. For your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And did, does that resonate with you as well, Yanoa? Um, the visible and invisible. I work as a playwright, mm -hmm. and I think when I'm writing, and I'm writing dialogue, or writing people moving on, the, on, um, on, on a scene, in a scene, all that is visible to me are blurs, or blobs, because um, the play often hasn't been cast yet. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea who's gonna be speaking the words, what they look like and how the words sit in them. Mm. So I'm always writing into the dark and just hoping it finds its mark. But also um, writing a play is like submitting an unfinished algebraic equation to a theater and saying, there's gonna be X here. X marks the spot and that spot is the audience. But I have no idea who they will be but we're piloted by faith alone. The entire process is that. Often I don't know who the designers are, the costume designers, et cetera. All I have is text and words. So I have to accept that I've created what is visible, which is actually still invisible, and then the completion of the entire project is still beyond me. So it's part of, it's, it's at the crux of being a playwright. It's all about collaboration, and it's all about um, trust, even though I don't know who I have to trust yet. So, I think it's, it's really there. And each the playwright um, sits the longest with invisibility and with visibility. Mm -hmm. um, because you begin the idea for the story, you start writing it, sometimes it's five to six years, drafting and redrafting, before anyone else comes to the project. They come, they perform the play, after three or four weeks, the play ends. And then um, that might be the end of the play, which is unfortunate in most cases, but then, the dream is that the play lives beyond this production, which means that you hope for a whole other cast or the director and a whole other set of people who are still invisible to you to take on this text and make it visible again. So it's this endless cycle of birth and rebirth and death, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really happy that you mentioned that with playwriting because I think part of my, I think what's so interesting about theater and playwriting is that, you know, the performance are always driven by this blurring between dreams and reality. Eh? And part of what I'm wondering is, and I think this kind of, it seems to be a quite congruent opinion across all four of you, is that, you know, can the idea of dreams in some way also allow for you to actually sustain or resist the pressures to over-accommodate to your audiences that may not understand your work immediately? Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that might be specific to the kind of art um, as a playwright, my main job is to entertain an audience. If I haven't done that, I've, I've, I've failed drastically, which means that I have to consider them even if I don't know who they are, mm -hmm. which makes the process of editing a play really intricate because you're, you're, question, you're playing 3D chess with, an op with, with opponents who you don't even know who they are, but you have to trust that, that the game will be, have been worth it at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for me, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I have to consider my audience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sir, were you going to say something? I don't that? consider my audience. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, I feel like so often I'm trying to, especially in like the more formative parts of the process, mm -hmm. I'm trying to satisfy something for myself mm -hmm. and to ask myself, like, am I okay first? Mm -hmm. 
and then as the work begins to make its way into the world, depending on what medium and what form it is, because mm -hmm. writing a novel is mostly a solitary activity yeah. for a couple of years, and it might be an editor and an agent that sees the work, but otherwise it takes up until the work is finished before people get let into that space, mm -hmm. which the introvert in me really loves, because I can just <laughs> kind of really lock myself mm -hmm. away and be in that place where I can be my most honest okay. self and actually one of the better versions of myself. Yeah. Um, but then like, filmmaking also allows something that is really collaborative yes. and makes work that goes beyond yourself. Yeah. Um, but I think the intentions are always to do things that satisfy you as a group, yeah. as a crew. Um, and that uh, everything else for me feels like a bonus. Like yeah. the fact that people engage with my work is really, really special and that like, you know, if someone reads my novel, that it grows a life that I couldn't have imagined. Mm -hmm. But it's such, a, it's such a bonus for me because at the point that the work left my hands, I was happy. I was yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I have a more antagonistic relationship with the idea of an audience. I mean, I prioritize my relationship to the work above all else. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also think about the capacity to, um, like, push people into uncomfortable places or to make them consider things in a way maybe that they're not used to. I think viewing art, well, painting specifically, mm -hmm. there's a rhythm or a pattern that people fall into of what they expect and how comfortable they are reading an image, how quickly they look at it, all these sorts of things. And I try to disrupt that as much as possible, which is why my paintings are so chaotic. Um, I do awkward things in terms of how I install them. Um, I don't really make that much work, which is again like an, an act of like disrupting a system that prioritizes like overproduction okay. and you know making as much as possible and mm -hmm. always wanting to be seen and visible and acting like I'm the most productive person ever. Like all of those sorts of things, I think this idea of people coming to look at something that you've made is an opportunity to um, be a bit, not like difficult, but to challenge. Maybe that's a better way of framing it. And I think people have the capacity to be pushed quite a lot. And within that uncomfortable space, like a lot of interesting stuff can happen in terms of how they respond. Mm -hmm. Or it reveals things about how they respond to things that maybe they're not conscious of, yeah. and I think that's really important. I think people can be very like lazy with how they look at painting sometimes, or how they try to categorize people's practices, or me as a maker, mm -hmm. you know? And I want to um, make it as challenging as possible for people to, mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. If they do, it's fine, but... I don't want to make it easy for them. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. I hear that. And you've mentioned that mainly in relation to painting, but you also work quite a lot with sound. So how does that look like in sound? Um, with the sound-based stuff, it's something that can be more inclusive and like celebratory in terms of the emotional value of mm -hmm. the works. But they're also, I think I like layering. That's sort of how I work in painting, and it translates to sound as well. So. The idea of like abstracting sounds or sounds being um, difficult to understand or process or to even like hear or take. Again, there's this idea of like how does a body react to something that is maybe delightful or unbearable? Like this like overflow of like feeling. Like how can you use that to shape someone's thinking or guide them or share something with them? So that's kind of how it operates in that capacity. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think. The idea of like citation and referencing and bringing forth, like that's really important um, in my practice. And I do that a lot in sound, thinking about black sound and as creators of sound, like we're like geniuses. So it's kind of like the idea of spotlighting or yeah, like bringing things together so that they're, um, I don't know, like presented in a way that maybe isn't it's both ordinary and unordinary. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, for me, 
if I'm not making work that I'm not getting something out of it, I don't care, <laughs> if I'm honest. If I'm not understanding myself better or getting some sort of release, I can't make the work in my art practice. Mm. But um, the second project I did was called Wish You Were Here. And it was basically a response to my first project. Surprisingly, the first project I've ever kind of did, did really well and sold a lot. And then I felt like I had to, people kind of told me you need to keep making work explicitly about race. And I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. But mm -hmm. there was just like all of these kind of voices. Um, and the work I ended up making was a real conversation with black creatives um, and about um, ownership and um, authenticity and anger. And the titles were Rob This England or Bitch Better Have My Money or another title was you know the Viola Davis um, gif where she gets up, she's like... <laughs> one of them was a direct reference to that, which my community know all too well. We can just put that gift up and people will know what that means. But the gallerists were like, what does this mean? And I was like, you see, that's how I feel sometimes. Because mm. I remember when I first came to the Tate, no shade, um, when I was 19, I remember coming out lo looking in a room, I don't know what it was, cubism or something, and just feeling like I've got no frame of reference. And mm. like, sometimes... It, there was zero access and it felt like really exclusive and you had to have this prior knowledge that was kind of inaccessible to this like girl from South London who's 19 and I always it would be nice to make work I felt that my community really understands and other people need to kind of work a little bit harder to get mm -hmm. so there's a kind of um excitement about making some things uh, a bit kind of um, invisible or coded. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that resonates <laughs> quite beautifully with what you're saying. And I was just going to add and say, well, it's not so much not invisible, but it's what Edward Lisson actually talks about and calls opacity, mm -hmm. right? The unwillingness to be immediately readable and understood by people mm. outside of that work. And I think what you all sort of seem to have across of your work is operating and working as artists and culture workers within a mainstream setting but trying to create these small pockets of familiarity so your mm -hmm. audiences know that you are mm -hmm. speaking directly to them mm -hmm. it's but, like a soft form of resistance yes <laughs> yes, yes. Uh -huh. it is yes. And, and it's also a resistance that is not trying to deliberately be resistant yes. but it's uh -huh. working for itself and to itself yeah uh -huh. and to the people that resonate with that exactly with that frame of um cultural reference mm -hmm. but i want to go back to you a bit and push you a bit because you mentioned something so beautifully early, and I think you both actually did, where you said that dreaming is almost a kind of rest, mm -hmm. and that you said that you return to your work and that space of dream as a way to give yourself some respite. Mm -hmm. And I read an interview in about your previous play, which was the Barbershop Chronicles, and what you had said was that your work was not so much about trying to do something too grand, but it was about trying to portray black men in a barbershop who were resting and black men who were talking and being in a space of comfort. And yet you just said earlier that, if I remember you correctly, that you don't really feel that you think about dreaming and reality as something that's sort of an interesting part of your work as a playwright. Yeah. But yet you mentioned that as being it. Um, I think it's, it's possible to be to rest in both spaces, mm -hmm. in the dream or in the real world or in the fantasy world, whether, whether you're awake or, or whether, whether you aren't, you know. Um, in theater, my job is to entertain. Mm -hmm. In poetry, my job is to be a witness. When I write poetry, it's mostly for me. That's my, that's my escape from the world. Mm -hmm. But theater exists very much in, in the world. And I think I'm in service of my community, my audience, and it's, it behooves me to, to not create a safe space for them, whoever they are, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I try to do so by making sure the work is accessible as possible. But also, it's also because I am an immigrant and I was born in Nigeria, moved to London when I was 12, moved to Dublin when I was 15, and I returned mm -hmm. when I was 18. And each time I was extracted from the communities that I was born into or communities that I fell in love with and had to go somewhere else and, and restart my identity, that makeup. And the way I was able to survive in those spaces was by being open and being welcoming and being okay. accessible and giving people the benefit of doubt. Even when they were saying um, booky, weird things to me, of always wondering, hmm, where is this coming from? Is this genuine interest? Is there something shadowy hidden beneath mm -hmm. that? 
which meant that I've always had to, um, to exist with various layers of consciousness mm -hmm. in real time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think when I'm writing or when I'm creating spaces or writing plays, that's always also is on the surface. Characters are speaking, but there are things happening behind them. Mm. And the audiences might come in and they may see that, and I go to lens to make sure to understand what it is, but there are also other things that they might not pick up. Mm -hmm. I remember when um, my previous play was called Three Sisters, it was under the National Theatre, and I could tell um, what types of audiences were in the room by how hard they laughed, mm -hmm. you know? So non-Nigerian spe Nigerian people would get a joke on some level. Nigerians would get a joke on another level. Nigerians who are Igbo would get the joke on another level. And Nigerians who are Igbo or grew up in the 80s would get it on a deeper level. And I could just, I could just feel. So there are various levels of reality in the room and I made allowances for that. But my job was to entertain within that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. And how does that look so just drawing on a point that you said, you know, dreaming as almost a kind of witnessing in some way, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. How does that look like for you as, you know, someone who works as a novelist, but also straddles filmmaking and photography as well? I think the way, so often I feel like with my work that I am merely a witness mm -hmm. to just like the world around me and the community around me and those really small moments that like you go home and tell your partner, you tell your mom about, um, that feel like they're the fabric of our everyday lives. Like that's my real interest. Mm -hmm. um, and in trying to find a way, find a way to communicate that in a way that you just don't, like that I could write a sentence or I could make an image and you could read the sentence or see the image and not just know it, but also feel it mm. as well. <laughs> um, to make something that, that's more tangible than mm. the, just the medium that we're working within. Yeah. Um, I always think of, like so much of my work in the aesthetic is related to music and specifically black music and the rhythms mm. and the spaces and the quiets and the silences that we all are working mm -hmm. within. Yeah. Um, and trying to figure out how to write a sentence or to make an image or to make a set of images that move that feel like music, that mm. feel like black music, that feel like the spaces that, you know, the pockets that Coltrane was playing within or like the kind of like, I'm, like, I'm really obsessed with John Coltrane at the moment and yeah. the way that like some of his music just sounds like chaos. Mm. But there are these like little pockets of time and space that like you, sit within and you recognize something within yourself but mm. you don't quite know what it is or how to articulate it. Mm. I think for me that's the thing that I'm always trying to witness. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really beautiful way to describe it. So dreaming as, as some kind of artistic intervention that actually troubles with the idea of a pure, pure determination or idea of things. And, and do you then feel that trying to straddle all those boundaries and those ways of working actually allows for you to work across and against your discipline in some way? And is that deliberate? Yeah, I think I'm always, whenever, whichever medium I'm working with in, I'm always asking myself, what are the boundaries of mm. this medium? Mm. And how do I take down these walls and just start building them up brick by yeah. brick? Um, and for me, I think I was saying this to you just before we started, like the different forms that I work with in, those lines are beginning to disappear because I've allowed the space for different pieces of work to influence each other. Mm. I've allowed for music to come into the space mm -hmm. and to be loud or to be quiet or to be silent. Mm -hmm. And I've allowed for the images that I make to sort of burst in on mm -hmm. my written work and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And there is something that feels like I'm trying to slowly work out where by the work is I don't know, I'm really jealous of painters, and I always have been, because like, there's so much texture in your work, mm -hmm. and it's so beautiful, and I think I'm always, like, sp like speaking specifically to the novel, I feel like I'm always trying to stuff as much into the work without it feeling claustrophobic, okay, so that I can yeah. afford it this sense yeah. of texture, that it yeah. feels like it's like lifted mm -hmm. off the page, that you're turning in the page, you can actually feel what's going on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know? I know what you mean, yeah. I think like people that do that so well are like, um, like bell hooks and Gwendolyn Brooks mm -hmm. and you're just like the way they use language 
is, yeah, just amazing. But I think, like, following on from what you were saying, I, I think it's interesting to think about how working in a way that kind of traverses, like, different practices or, like, ways of working um, also can relate to how you reach an audience. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't have to know about painting to talk about painting. Like, you can know a lot about music or know a lot about um, your dislike of the colour of orange mm -hmm. or know a lot about um, a particular relationship to, I don't know, like a part of your body or like everything about what I do is focused on being as accessible as possible and trying to push conversations about painting into territories that aren't dictated by this sort of very exclusionary, mm. you know, yeah. you have to be educated or aware of history mm -hmm. yeah. to feel like you can comment on this or you can contribute to the conversation of like what painting is today or how it impacts people's lives and something that I really enjoy doing is working with other people so working with writers or musicians and inviting them to respond to my practice so that I get to learn as well as think about the work through a different lens mm -hmm. and that's something that's really important, I think, so that there aren't these limits on how we talk mm -hmm. to each other about what we make or how we understand what we make and mm -hmm. we don't um, create unhelpful boundaries for mm -hmm. our audiences as well. Like, yeah. That's really important. And I think it's very easy to fall into a pattern of like, oh, only a certain type of person is going to talk about this work, so really, that's who we're addressing whenever we put on an event or whenever we write about the work. We're only talking to these people, so we don't have to think outside of um, what, we've already, what we've been doing for like years in terms of how we engage audiences. And I'm like, mm, what does it mean to speak to like a young black child? Like, I'm always talking about me. Like, I wish I had some sort of access to like what you were saying. Like, I felt like I could... I'm quite loud and, like, bullshit, but I think there was always this sense of... Um, how do I talk about things that I care about when I feel like I'm not invited, mm -hmm. like, to speak? And I want there to always be an invitation in the work. As much as things might be coded or hidden, mm -hmm. there is always a, you can say something about this, you can say anything. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, yeah, that's sort of how I try to operate with mm -hmm. what I do. Just following on from what you said, mm -hmm. like, it made me think of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just quite curious about how that looks like in your practice, um, Heather. Because, you know, with photography, it's, it's a constant relationship about speculation and, like, fiction yes. and not fiction. Yeah. And when you're delving into the archive and working with such, you know, stories that are so fra fraught mm -hmm. and in some way also just very, very tense, how do you sort of draw on that way and maybe even think about the relationship between fiction and non-fiction to, to sort of work against your discipline or even within or across it? Um, I think when I first worked with archives with Autograph ABP, mm -hmm. the amount of erasures and gaps, and uh, I remember there was a beautiful photo of this um, black child, which is called Black Boy, but actually the image was just full of, like, power and symbolism and, mm -hmm. like, it just got reduced to something. So I feel like I take advantage of those gaps to reimagine and expand those limitations. Mm -hmm. So I have, because I work with reimagination, I have actually a huge amount of freedom um, that also, for me, I've got an issue with respectability politics in terms of like, us as black artists have to make this sort of work. And mm -hmm. I thought uh, dreaming and imagination allows me to um, circumvent them. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I guess, that I think I've got an issue with respect to politics because it impacted me so much as a child. Mm -hmm. And like, as like immigrant kids presenting ourselves in this certain way because of survival, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I remember I had a lot of like, segue, I had a lot of resentment for like older adults because I was like, why are you telling us to position ourselves in this way? But it was really to protect us and preserve us. Mm -hmm. So I, in my work, I'm always trying to find like a safe space whether it be in my head or like a physical safe space for me to kind of 
dream about myself in this really expansive way and like, mm. what if I did this? What if I was a woman in this mm. 19th century and had all of this power or like, it just, um, it allows me to kind of, um, kind of be my fullest self. Mm -hmm. And also as black artists, I feel like, well, kind of, it's more of like a social economic um, statement, but um, if you don't have a lot of money as an artist, your dreams are limited, right? When I, when I started making work, I was like, what is the cheapest way to make these images? I didn't, I, I didn't dream in that sort of way of um, thinking about materiality or enjoying the process. It was always about the outcome, right? So um, I'm really trying to um, embrace, uh, as black artists, enjoying the process of the work and not just the outcome. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because before, it, for me, it felt like a luxury. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, the cheapest way and conserving a amount of energy. So I feel like my practice, the thing I get out of it most is process because my work's all therapeutic. It's all about understanding myself. So I make sure I center that experience. And the images, the images are the images. But mm -hmm. for me, I've got, I've got what I needed from the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. And speaking of black women in the 19th century, I'm a huge fan of your 2016 series, The Black Amores, Too Many Black Amores, yeah. I think it's called. And, and I find that so fascinating because this is such a great example of your work that tries to deal with the archive, but then also straddles the boundaries between speculation, mm -hmm. speculating fiction, but also nonfiction through the representation of, um, sorry, I've forgotten her name. Sarah Falls Benetta. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. And I'm, I'm just wondering, is that, that could, is a quite interesting example of your work that tries to work against your discipline of, of photography. Yeah. Yeah. There is um, an obsession I have with the past because I think for a long time the past felt completely violent to me and mm -hmm. I really wanted to avoid it because of kind of gaps of knowledge and what I was presented as reality. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of like re-engaging with the past and finding truth or wisdom or power especially with a black woman living in the UK, whose kind of story was silenced until now, mm. there is a, uh, it feels like the conversation with the past is actually something I really needed to kind of reconcile where I was. Like mm. I said, when I was 19 and I felt like, what is this reality? I felt like I had to engage with just not my personal, not just my personal past, but the past in general of the presence of black British people here to mm. kind of um, keep moving forward. It was something I needed to, had to create that intervention to kind of like recalibrate who I was. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, Too Many Black Awards was the first, it was, I was like pooing myself making that work because it, I remember my mum, so all, all my images, it's me. I remember my mum looking at it and she was like, that's not you, like, and I was like, it's me mum, like that's me because she hadn't seen that side of me ever before. And it was like reintroducing myself not just to myself, but to my, my family and loved ones. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that was the help with kind of looking back. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. And maybe this is a question more directed to Caleb and Inua, but I'm quite curious about, you know, how does the creation of a character in a literary work um, perhaps in some way reveal either the boundaries between dreams and reality or completely refuse the boundaries between the two? <laughs> <laughs> I think you, because I, I don't really make make up characters. What do you mean? All of them are based on people. I I steal people. Well, people, characters. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah, and I just I collapse. I, 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 I like a magpie for things. Like I was looking at your nails mm -hmm. and um, the, the little gems you have. I was thinking, yeah, that's that's going in a character. <laughs> <laughs> I've been immortalized. <laughs> yes. Mm, I have. Uh, I think the world. I'm in a constant state of research mm -hmm. when I'm out in the world. I'm thinking, taking, hearing things, the way people walk, hairstyles, etc. And I just build characters based on 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 the world. I don't. I don't really. I don't really make up shit like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I find it, I find it immensely difficult, but also unnecessary. Mm -hmm. The world is vomiting stuff at you constantly. Mm -hmm. Just remold it and, and have it speak. That's, that's what I do. I don't, you know, yeah, that's, that, yeah. There's, mm -hmm. just, there's just so much, so much out there. It, it's, it's full of gems. I just, mm -hmm. I just take them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think you make up characters. 
I, I don't know if I necessarily make up characters. I make up spaces. Mm. Yeah. I feel like the, I feel like my central focus is always on making and creating space where I could place people and see what might happen within that space. Mm -hmm. Within that space, it's always, it is always black people. Mm -hmm. And I'm always trying to think of like, how do I afford whoever is in this space infinitude? Like, how could I give this sense of complexity mm -hmm. to all of the emotions that they might be feeling mm -hmm. in this specific moment? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so much of, I think, and I think that's where the big crossover is between my photographic work and my written work. Like, I kind of imagine these images and then I can, tr I like transcribe everything that I can see mm -hmm. and that I can feel in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time, these characters, like, you know, they have, they feel very real to me. They have flesh, they, they have emotions, yeah. they have their angst. Um, but I want them to roam about free in the space and to see what might happen yeah. Yeah. if they are placed in a space where actually they're allowed to react in the way that they might want to, yeah. to an injustice or to something painful or to something joyous. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the time, these characters are sort of forming themselves off the basis of the space yeah. that I've made for them. Yeah. But I, th I think there are parallels between that and what it is when you create art that is improvised in mm. theatre. Also, um, in jazz, which you're a huge fan of, that's what, yeah, I see that. When, when the, the musicians are allowed to improvise and to create frameworks and spaces where they can be themselves and just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Me? I, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying anything else, yeah. <laughs> Now you're off. <laughs> off? Okay, they're back. They're back. Thank okay. you. Cool. Speak. Oh, no. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that would work, sorry. I did it so confidently. <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, jazz, I like that. I don't really plan very much. I feel like so much of my work is creation by way of improvisation. Mm. Um, but like really with the, like the main basis being the space, the structure, mm. yeah. and then letting people just roam about and letting my mind and my thoughts and my emotions roam about within that. Mm. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Heather? Because you do sometimes create characters in your work. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what everyone's reminding me? I did a project called The Body Remembers, and it was... Um... I'll turn you on. Hello? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Anticipation. <laughs> I can project, also. Um, I did a project called The Body Remembers, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, it was completely improvised. So I entered a space for 45 minutes, and there was, it was around how trauma is um, internalized in the body. So it wasn't about a traumatic experience, it was about how trauma feels like, smells like, and the idea of to process trauma, you need to let it move in your body and release. That was the whole project. And the audience were very um, needed to witness what was happening to me, and they had their own experience. Um, and, I, and I was petrified because I would enter the space and I had no idea what I was gonna do. All I knew is that I would go through six parts of my body and whatever happens would happen. And I'm not a dancer. Caleb saw the performance. I'm not a dancer. It was so good. It was but so, um, so good. all sorts happened. Like I to the point where I was like, what is actually happening? Like who is like not a possession, but like something just took over me and I was flying all over the place and I would cry and I'd stop and I'd laugh hysterically and I'd shout. And there is something about like improvisation, dreaming, um, the unconscious, just mm -hmm. allowing those hidden parts of you to speak. Like they're loud, they're really loud. And um, um, I'm also an overthinker, so the, I, that having a space and not thinking so much mm. um, kind of made me realize how um, intuitive and wise I am. This is a big thing for me to admit, but um, there's a part of me that has like a inherent wisdom in it by allowing my body to just move and not um, censoring it. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's huge stuff in dreaming and the unconscious. Mm. And I think um, what 
I love about what I love about acting, like straight acting, when I do like TV work, is that um, the art piece is moving and it's continuous, and there's a journey and there's a narrative, and that feels really delightful because you see my work and you kind of have this conversation happening, but um, when I'm acting in a play or something, you, there is a journey happening and there is an emotional investment that I feel really lucky to have, to hold someone's time for like two hours mm. or like 10 hours for a TV show or something and, and um, go on a journey with them in that way. That feels really exciting too. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Now I know, Rachel, you talk a lot about working, especially in your painting, through you know, abstraction. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder, you know, although there is, you know, there is like a deliberate distortion in the way in which that you work, I'm just wondering whether, do you deliberately also blur because you don't want your subjects, your characters in your painting to exist with the intrusion of anyone as a viewer? Are there characters in your abstract paintings? Mm, I suppose, yeah, like if teeth can be defined mm -hmm. as characters or like a mouth can be a character. Mm -hmm. I see them as bodies or like um, entities that are reflections of bodies or things that are felt by bodies. Yeah. And um, yeah, everything is made up. Like I never have a plan for a painting. So it's a very responsive activity. It's like I have all my like oil pastels in front of me and I just pick something up and I start colouring. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I don't know. There's just this, what I would define as like a call and response, like a listening and a looking, and then I act. And then I listen and I look, and it's just like this until I feel like everything holds itself together enough. Nothing is ever finished in a way that it's like solid, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's moving and it's alive and it's communicating something that is um, registering it, like within my body at a level where I'm like, like I hear, I hear something or like I, I feel something and like that's basically the process of like making something. And then within that maybe there are symbols that have significant meanings. Like there was a point where I was painting gold teeth and that in a way is like a, it's not a character, but it's like a reference to a person because like my granddad had like some gold teeth and I was like, I want to start to think about people or the idea of like honoring or calling or calling to or sort of pointing to people. And then the color yellow becomes like very symbolic of something and is characterized. So that's, kind of the only way I really engage with the idea of um, creating, I don't know, like specific relationships to like people or the idea of, mm -hmm. of people or something, but yeah. Okay, great. I have, I think maybe one final questions before we round it up to the audiences and hear if they have some questions for you as well, but. I'm just wondering in, you know, how does, I guess, maybe fiction, non-fiction or dreams and reality, the boundaries or lack of boundaries um, allow you as artists and practitioners to imagine a future? Oh, like a world future? Any, any kind of future. Okay. Or futures. Mm hmm It doesn't have to be an answer now. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like, uh, um. uh, <laughs> mm. I feel like specifically when writing fiction, mm -hmm. um, that I get the opportunity to think about this idea that a scholar Tina Kant proposes about futurity mm -hmm. and about mm -hmm. like making a future or imagining a future for yourself in mm. the now. Uh -huh. And I get to ask myself the questions about what that mm. looks like because I get to build a world that is not dissimilar from this one, but yeah. I get to inject whatever I want into mm. it. And so I get to ask, what would it look like if this act was not, like, was not retaliated against, but was treated with grace? Mm. Um, and I get to ask myself, like, what would it mean if our parents got to tell 
their stories and not have to hold on to them. Yeah. And I get to ask like kind of questions like that and begin to undo things or begin to like try and shift um, the world as I know it yeah. in my mind and then think about how I can take that and enact that in my everyday. That's a really beautiful way to describe that. Yeah. Yeah. Heather? I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> in the clouds. Um, like I said, my work is all about me, and I think it's expanding who I am, actually. I think visual culture, growing up, played quite an oppressive part in my life in terms of limiting who I thought I am and who I could be, and also the... Um, my, my mother, speaking about versions of herself, is quite limited because of trauma, right? She mm -hmm. has to protect parts of her. And I know as much as I ask her, she won't tell me because she needs to protect that. So I'd rather imagine and create um, radical possibilities, not just for my mum, but also for me. Like, like beautifully how Caleb said they didn't have those opportunities. So how can I um, honor her? In, I feel like I honor her and kind of my family through um, seeing myself as expansive as possible. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, yeah, I just think about things that are unseen that need to be revealed and um, wanting to like look to the future as like um, something that allows me to, um, I don't know, like use the agency that I have as an artist, but also just like as a person to like recreate or to, I don't know, like, like prioritize my needs as a way of caring for others. Like the idea that you work on yourself first and then via that you're able to help so many other people mm -hmm. and I think making stuff allows me to do that because it comes more about than just making a picture mm -hmm. it's about my relationship to how I make things and who I make things for and what do those people experience when they look at what I make and so I think working in that way means that the future for me is always being shaped by my actions now and the intentions that I have. And so I'm always like considering like how I want to um, like make space basically for myself and others and bring the things that are hidden within myself out and hidden in others into a, like a, a realm where they're looked at and they're addressed and they're felt and they exist in a real capacity. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I think there's a lot of, I don't know what you're talking about with your mum, there's a lot of like tempering things and managing things, you know, yeah. so we can cope or we can survive. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think the idea of like revealing and um, doing so in a way that is like careful, mm -hmm. um, like that's what I think is most generative for me in the idea of like what can come or what can be made. Um, so yeah, it's a strange answer. I don't know. It makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a somewhat bleak answer, mm -hmm. which is that I don't. I don't really think of the future that mm -hmm. much. Um, uh, Do we have an Afro pessimist on the? <laughs> <laughs> an Afro pessimist. Wow. <laughs> no. 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 Um, I left Nigeria in 1996, like I said, and because of the hostile immigration, the hostile immigration, the hostile environment, immigration policy, and um, just the madness of this country, it took 26 years to become a British citizen, and I became a citizen in June this year. Wow. So for the longest possible time, I, I wasn't sure if I'd have a future in this country. Mm -hmm. So I just got used to dealing with the present. Mm -hmm. yeah. And most of my work comments on the present. Mm -hmm you know, and explains the world as it is from liminal or ignored or marginalized points of view. Mm -hmm. And that's how I, how, I do, how I create art. I embrace my understandings and my misunderstandings and, and, you know, and write from those perspectives. So that's, I don't really think of the future. I think I'm now able to think of the future and it's frightening, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, 
a play that I've written. It sort of looks at climate change, but it's set in a dystopian future, and I'm looking for hope within that. But that's the first play that I've written that looks into what might be, mm. but it's heavily based on what is right now. But mm -hmm. for, yeah, I don't really think of the future that much. Maybe, maybe I think I have to now, <laughs> now yeah. that I can. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit of a luxury, isn't it, sometimes, to yeah, think yeah. beyond what is in, well, no, it is, to think beyond what's in front of you. Mm. Like, even the idea of, like, daydreaming, mm. like, mm -hmm. thinking about what could be, like, there's hopefulness, and, yeah, like, the idea of using hope or feeling like you can access that feeling of hope is actually, yeah, it's not a given. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I think it's so beautiful to hear that across all three of you dreaming or the concept of dreaming in some way, it's seen as like a community building practice, right? Mm -hmm. And it takes us maybe a bit back to the beginning where in my brief introduction, why I did mention that in quite a lot of, you know, indigenous, but also African um, frameworks of understanding dreams. It's a thing, not just for yourself, but you can dream for others as much as you can dream for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think on that note, maybe we'll just open up the floor to some audience questions to send. Thank you so much to our panel for these really wonderful reflective thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, no questions out there? It's all done. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just um, thinking about uh, abstraction mm -hmm. and intimacy. So um, when you were talking about representation and about the invisible and invisible and kind of seeing each other, um, I was also thinking about how sometimes that can be also quite violent, you know, quite su surveilling and talking about like respectability politics and such. And um, uh, I guess in like a contrast to thinking about abstraction, and I was just wondering whether you thought, uh, all of you, whether you had thought um, or think about intimacy within abstraction or whether there is, whether that is possible, whether there is some sort of intimacy in abstraction. And I don't know if this kind of goes back to the thing of things being sort of illegible or not, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I was just wondering what your thoughts were about that. Mm -hmm. I think there is because of the way um, I prioritize like feeling um, as a way of understanding or um, it's a form of communication. Like, you know how like you can um, feel nervous and you have like butterflies and it's like your body is telling you something um, or if you really fancy someone and like you're just inadvertently like want to be close to them or you're like just instinctively like touch them or whatever. I think there are these ways that our bodies respond to the things that we feel. And I th making paintings is, for me, entirely um, predicated on me feeling and then making things that are responses to those feelings that I have and wanting to help other people think about how they feel or how they, um, how their bodies react or don't react. Um, and my relationship to colour is what helps me to do that. So the idea of um, using colours in ways that are maybe like repulsive or gross or really nice. Like I think about, um, you know, like how cartoon characters, when they smell pie, like they're like float along in their nose or if they lick something, it's like the whole face goes round and like there's like saliva. Every I'm just like, mmm, like tasty. Like there's this intimacy I feel about like colour and emotion that is very specific and private to me but I think all people have that in their own ways and I like to engage with those sorts of um, yeah like ideas because the history of abstraction in like 
a white male perspective is always very grand and outside, you know, and it registers at a point where like you're supposed to be provoked into feeling stuff, but it's in a way that doesn't seem to be um, based on like a private or like interior mm -hmm. intimacy. It's like a, a worldly or sort of um, highly spiritual, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, what does it mean to think about your body and your lived experience and the things that your body responds to when you're thinking about abstraction. And I think that's very prevalent in music and sound, but we all understand that. But I think visually it's a bit more complicated or it's not something that's spoken about that much, mm. so. Yeah, I think to build on what Rachel was saying, um, especially with regards to like the history of abstraction from a point of view of white men and white artists, I think a lot of that, their work and the understanding of abstraction has sort of been like rooted in idea of painters performing some idea of like color blindness in some way mm -hmm. and a color blindness that has assumed a universality of abstraction but also one that has completely recognized the hyper visibility of black black presence in in the history of western art art um, history and i think the intimacy of abstraction is that black artists very often have had to draw on that as a method to really think about a new way of challenging its assumed universality and challenging ways of trying to portray you know black worldviews and black experiences but from a perspective that refuses to be directly legible to people's understanding of black people in the canvas if that makes sense mm -hmm. um yeah mm -hmm. I'm not a painter, sorry, but I just had a question. A no, 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 it's a very valid point. Uh. <laughs> hey, thank you all for speaking so beautifully mm -hmm. and helping us to dream collectively. Um, it's been really nourishing of a Friday evening. I think to make my question relevant to the subject matter, I'm going to ask you, like, what, what did you start out dreaming as a young artist? And now that you've attained the accolades, the success, and the kind of stability and sustainability in your practice mm -hmm. that many artists aspire to. What do you dream of now? Mm. But that's just to make it relevant. And I think what I actually want to talk about is something that happened this week. And there's a sequence of events that made me feel quite conflicted. And I wanted to hear your opinions on it. Um, and that was the kind of tricolon crescendo of um, Isaac Julian becoming a sir, David Ajay receiving the Order of Merit. Oh, yeah. And then in the same week, or literally a day later, the Baroness Hussey debacle at the Royal Palace when Sister Space went to speak to the royal household and were accosted and made racialized and othered by one of the royal ladies-in-waiting. Oh, wow. I didn't know this. Don't we have a troublemaker in our midst? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the connection between those two points is that I guess though those are all sort of recognitions of attainment or uh -huh. um, a kind of public validation mm -hmm. being granted at the highest level by the royal family and mm -hmm. I wanted to know whether that sort of validation was ever part of your dreams and if it's uh -huh. not what do you dream of now and what does a black <laughs> artist dream of no that is not a priority uh -uh, no um, uh, Don't you have an OB, Caleb? No. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. <laughs> um, one you did. I used to just dream about being able to make art. Like that, yeah. I was like, oh my God, like, how do I make stuff, you know? I remember being like eight and like drawing and being like, oh, I could be an artist, but only people like Van Gogh are artists. So mm. I'll just do something to, like, kind of related to art, but not. And so for a long time, I was like, I'm going to be an animator. And that was the path I was going down. And um, it was like a huge moment to admit to myself that I wanted to be an artist. So that was the biggest dream for me, was just to spend all my time making stuff. And then to do that without the expectation of anything. Like, it wasn't about having a career. I just, it just made me happy. And I was like, I want to be happy. So it's like a very simple kind of um, focus. And 
now that I'm in the position that I'm in, I actually really care about like education and I teach um, all sorts of ages, like small children, adults, like young people, and I'm a university lecturer and I just think so, there are so many things wrong with the systems that educate, um, well, I don't know, like a variety of people, but especially like black students or people of colour and I want to do something that addresses that. So I think, yeah, that's really where my hopes lie. If I think about the future mm -hmm. um, and like think about myself as like a young black child who didn't think I could be an artist, you know, and wanting to address that because I think it exists not just in a racial sense, but in like an economic sense um, and like an ability um, sense, like there are all these like barriers, um, even like psychological personal barriers we have or familial barriers and I care about. Just to be able to look after my family and myself, those, those are my immediate dreams. And now that um, I'm more established, um, I still want to look after my family pretty much. Um, so all I try to do with the quote unquote accolades is figure out how to monetize it to look after my community. Pretty much um, that's it. And with regards to the royal family and all of that brouhaha and that establishment, what it means, um, I've been to Buckingham Palace twice. Um, uh, I stole toilet paper from, <laughs> <laughs> from the toilet because <laughs> my little sister wanted to wipe her ass with what the queen wiped her ass with. <laughs> um, and um, which is to say, which is not to say the whole establishment boils down to a piece of shit, but Literally, that is what, that's, what, that's what my little sister want, thought, and that was the physical embodiment of that. But I remember the second time, the second time I went, um, there were these, you're not allowed to wear headgear if you're a man, but I was wearing a hat like this, and I think they thought it was culturally insensitive to ask me to take it off, or if it was of religious importance, and I didn't correct them. So I was wearing my crown, and um, Queen Elizabeth II was wearing hers. And I remember when I left, I walked all the way back from um, Buckingham Palace to Nunhead to the tiny flat that I lived in with all my three sisters and my parents because I was hyper aware of the illusion of what it meant to be in that space. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take it right back to the South London, to, to the working class black communities that I lived who are so um, affected by that establishment. And that's what it means to me, a literal, a piece of shit and illusions. Yeah, yeah. I didn't comment on that thing, but yeah, like, just not into that. No. Nah. The idea of, I think, of like perform, like we have to perform in some capacity just to survive, like the psychic toll of that day in, day out, I think um, for me is like the grandeur of being like given an honor will never erase the work I have to do daily to thrive, you know? And so I think no matter how many gestures there are, the things that really need to change, like they're not being taken care of. So fundamentally, it all, but it, yeah, like it, it's just like playing house to me, really. I'm not, not that impressed by it. <laughs> um, I think for me, when I started making work, I, I think the question that was like at the forefront of my mind was like, how can I be vulnerable and survive? Because at that time, I, vulnerability was death. Like, it was all about survival and protection. So as I started making work, I was like, is this possible to be vulnerable and actually survive and do kind of, and kind of function really well? Mm -hmm. And now my dream is to own a house outright. I don't know how that's gonna happen. And, uh, have a big house and for it to be a place for respite that people could come for rest. Because I remember someone opened their house to me um, when I was kind of going through a crisis and just gave me time to just write and cry and run around. And that was like everything to me. Mm -hmm. So to have, I think it's ownership. I think it's that idea of like, I've worked with a lot of black institutions and some of them have gone because their NPO status has gone or Arts Council have taken the money or whatever. And 
the thing with the OBEs or all of those accolades is that it's, a, it's slippery because things can be taken away. Like mm. you don't have complete ownership of even of your voice. I know a friend who has an OBE and even the way she can, she, they um, can talk about um, the royal family is very, um, uh, it's tricky. They're media trained to like talk in a certain way. And um, I think we're done with that. For me, I'm done with like policing myself. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so not being policed is what I'm dreaming about. Yeah. Um, I think growing up, I always just wanted to write. Mm. I was just obsessed. I was so like obsessed with language and what you could, communi could communicate with a sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and I always, I think as around like 16, 17, 18, when I said to myself that this is the thing that I want to do, I was so set on writing sentences that could feel like music or like an image or like a film. Um, and that is still like such a primary focus for me, like hearing, it was like a strange outer body experience hearing my bio read out at the beginning mm. because I forget about that stuff so often because the intimacy of the process of the actual making mm -hmm. is like of primary importance. It's yeah, like yeah. so, so key mm -hmm. for me to like really center that and for it to be mine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and everything else to be welcomed, but also for it to be an addition. Yeah, a bonus. to know its place. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. um, and I think for me, that's like, that still is the central focus. But like you, I'm also looking outwards about mm -hmm. thinking about how people who, when I was 16, I didn't really think, I, there weren't really many like British, black British novelists or mm -hmm. like black British filmmakers or like photographers kind of operating at the level that I wanted to. And so mm -hmm. thinking about how not only can I make an example, but also make the space mm -hmm. for younger people to think that I can also do this. Yeah. yeah. Or even like they exist but you just don't know about them. You know, like yeah. why is Van Gogh my only reference of how to be an artist? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Like because that's what I'm taught in school. Yeah. Yes, so valid. Like I love him but what else as well? Like what else is relevant to the other people in the room? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. I.e. me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think for me that's the, the focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean I think you know everything that you said resonates quite deeply with me. I'm I mean, I'm from Copenhagen in Denmark, so I'm, I came here as a migrant almost nine years ago and settled here. But growing up in Denmark, the arts, I'd never dreamed of becoming an artist. I had hopes and thoughts about becoming a curator, but I didn't really know what that was as a job and what it meant to work with artists, as in you don't want to be a curator, but you still want to work in close enough intimate relationship with the arts. But I come from a photography loving family growing up and art, and photography mainly was really a way for me to escape in, in some way out of my realities of growing up as a very young black woman in a homogeneously white space in Copenhagen. Um, and I think as I grew sort of older, my hopes was to continue working with art, but not in an isolated relationship, but more so trying to create an infrastructure in which that I could work with black artists and cultural workers around me to build community and to build an infrastructure that allows them to survive and thrive mm -hmm. off the work that they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still very much committed to that. And as far as any accolades from any government establishment with such a violent history as this royal family in this country, even in Denmark where I'm from as well, I have no interest in being immersed within that structure at all. That's simply not my dream. And I don't judge anyone who decides to do that. If you accept an OB, if you accept an MB, that's your decision and I don't judge you for it. But I think the issue is when an individual's acceptance of that particular order sort of becomes as a way for them to almost represent their community. Yeah. And they argue that they're doing it for the greater good of their community when mm. whether you accept your award or not, does absolutely nothing to render some of those ongoing systematic issues that affect mm -hmm. people outside of your circles. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think we should end it on that note. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our panel for that rich conversation. We've been recording this, so if you want to revisit, I saw some people taking notes. You can go back to the Later Tape Britain website and you can go and click on the stream. 
Uh, thank you for joining us. And yeah, please join me one more time in thanking our amazing panel.